Hello and welcome to the live package printing webinar, A Converter Perspective Using Digital Hybrid to Exceed Brand Expectations, sponsored by Mark Andy. I'm Corey Francer, Editor-in-Chief of Package Printing and the host of today's event. I'm really excited about today's session because this webinar is all about hearing from your peers about one of the most exciting and disruptive technologies impacting the industry today. Over the past few years, hybrid printing systems that combine digital and conventional printing have received a ton of buzz and there have been some great cases of early adopters discovering how the technology can benefit their business and their customers. We'll hear from two of those early adopters today. And at the end of today's presentation, we'll also have a question and answer session. So please be sure to submit your questions at any point during the webinar so we'll have them ready at the end. Um, and before we get started, um, let me just take a second to point out the Tips for Attendees widget on your console. Uh, it's the blue one with the wrench on it. If you missed the Tech Tips video that we played uh, leading up to the webinar, you can always click on this widget for more information. Joining us for today's webinar, we have Debbie Gilbert, co-founder and president of PRX Print, along with Brad Knoth, co-founder and CEO of Advantage Label. Today's panelists will be providing more background on their businesses later on in the webinar, but just as a quick overview, PRX Print is based in Mississauga, Ontario, and provides full-service packaging solutions across multiple market segments. Uh, as demand for printed labels increased, PRX Print opted to bring printing capabilities in-house with its installation of the Mark Andy Digital One Hybrid Press. Advantage Label, meanwhile, is a full-service label printer based in Grand Rapids, Michigan. The company has extensive experience in flexographic printing, but made the leap into digital in 2017 when it added two hybrid presses at the same time, a Mark Andy Digital Series and a Mark Andy Digital One. And we'll hear more from Brad later in the presentation about how Advantage Label leverages the capabilities of both technologies. Um, but before we bring on today's panelists, I wanted to provide an overview of what hybrid printing is all about and uh, some of package printing's research data that demonstrates the industry's continued need for both digital and conventional printing. Uh, so first, a bit of a definition. Um, hybrid printing you know, can mean a lot of different things in terms of combining multiple printing processes into one solution. Um, but for our purposes today, um, we're going to be referring to hybrid technology specifically as printing platforms that combine both conventional or analog printing with digital printing. Uh, so while hybrid printing has gained a lot of buzz in the industry over the last three or four years, it has actually been around for more than a decade in some form or another. Um, but as I'm sure many of you in the audience recall, it really didn't hit the scene on a strong commercial level until around Label Expo Europe in 2015, Label Expo Americas 2016. Um, at those events, several industry suppliers showcased a variety of hybrid platforms including those from single suppliers, those developed through partnerships between digital and Flexo suppliers, and even inkjet units that could be retrofit onto existing Flexo presses to create a hybrid platform. Uh, in the time since these shows, several printers and converters in the United States and beyond have adopted hybrid platforms and are implementing them in various ways to serve their customers. What makes hybrid so interesting in the industry is that when we talk about digital and conventional printing, it's almost always about when to use one technology versus another. But hybrid stands out in its ability to marry the advantages of both technologies together, allowing converters and their customers to access the best that each has to offer. Uh, while digital and conventional printing certainly provide um, different advantages, I wanted to highlight some statistics that demonstrate the industry's continued interest in each technology and then pairing them together as complementary processes. Um, these statistics come from a research report that Package Printing led earlier this year, which was sponsored by SGIA, and looked at printing technology investment interest among printers and converters. Um, in all, we received 109 responses. When we asked respondents about their likelihood to invest in both digital and conventional technologies over the next 18 months, um, it was interesting to see how high the interest level was across the board. Um, in terms of digital, we see here on the left that 50% were at least somewhat likely to invest with 25% stating they were very likely. Um, so given digital status as the newer of the technologies, the high, the high investment interest uh, makes sense. But what stood out here as well was that um, although it wasn't quite as high as digital, interest in conventional printing was still quite high with 34% of respondents stating that they were interested in investing uh, in the next year and a half. 
what this demonstrated to us was that the industry is viewing both technologies as integral to a successful future and are seeking, seeking ways to leverage the advantages of both, paving the way for hybrid. Um, so that now, now that we've laid the groundwork on what hybrid printing is and why the industry has shown an interest in this technology, I wanted to take a quick walkthrough of some of what's available out there. Um, when we talk about hybrid, the majority of systems that have been launched combine inkjet and flexographic printing and are geared toward the label segment. Um, but that doesn't constitute necessarily the entire array of hybrid options. Um, there have been systems emerging that combine EP or toner technology with flexography, uh, as seen on the bottom left here with the uh, Mark Andy Digital One. Um, but additionally, um, hybrid solutions combining sheet-fed offset and inkjet technology have begun to emerge to bring this groundbreaking technology beyond the label segment and into folding cartons. Um, based on the rapid rate of development in digital printing technology, I'd expect it to be just a matter of time until hybrid solutions are available across the board in packaging. Um, just like it did kind of in uh, standalone digital, hybrid will utilize the label segment as a launching pad before extending into uh, some of the other packaging segments. Um, but another interesting option for those pursuing hybrid is that access to this technology does not necessarily require an investment in a new press. An existing or even legacy Flexo press can be, um, become a hybrid platform through retrofitting an inkjet unit onto the press, instantly adding digital capabilities that were not previously available. But when it comes to hybrid, though, the advantages don't necessarily end with the ability to pair digital and conventional technologies together. Um, inline finishing and converting capabilities have also made hybrid platforms stand out in the realm of digital printing. It's been pretty well established that finishing for digital printing has been a significant challenge for standalone digital adopters, considering the inherent differences between typical digital and conventional output. Um, since digital is really designed to take on short runs requiring um, quick turnarounds, finishing these jobs with conventional processes often causes a bottleneck in which digital and conventional output shares an offline finishing platform, leading to increased downtime as more changeovers are required to, uh, to keep up with digital jobs. Uh, but with most hybrid printing platforms, finishing and converting processes are included right in line with the printing. Um, some of these processes include full or semi-rotary die cutting, lamination, spot colors, varnishes, adhesives, and beyond. Uh, in addition to the efficiency gains that these inline finishing processes provide, they also open up new opportunities for smaller craft or boutique brands to really dress up their labels in ways that they couldn't before. And as consumers increasingly seek out these types of brands, um, it's becoming increasingly important for them to be able to acquire digitally printed labels at short runs that are as eye-catching as their larger counterparts. Um, so for some context, I wanted to share this quote, uh, which comes from Ken Collins, VP of Sales and Marketing for AdCraft Labels. Um, I'd actually interviewed Ken back in July of last year for an article on AdCraft that ran in Package Printing Magazine about um, how the company had implemented hybrid printing into its operations. And Ken explained that you know, these brands really um, couldn't afford to do a six-color, screen-printed, no-look label in the past, but now we're able to do that in medium-sized runs and put in cold foils and put in metallic inks, things of that nature, which were never possible before. Um, so in an industry you know, as competitive as label printing, being able to utilize technology to offer something new to customers, something that they really didn't think was possible, can be an excellent way to differentiate your company. And so to provide a little more context into the advantages of hybrid printing, I wanted to share some more of our research findings into the top drivers of digital printing. Um, this comes from the same investment intention survey that I had mentioned earlier. Um, for this question, we asked only the respondents that stated that they had invested in digital printing over the past 18 months what their top drivers were in making their investment. Um, respondents could select as many choices from the provided list as they wanted, um, but in order, the top four results were um, short run production capabilities at 85%, variation, personalization, and customization at 69%, and increased speed to market at 63% and uh, customer demand for digital printing at 48%. Um, we did have some other options available, um, but for this presentation, I just kind of wanted to highlight these, uh, these top four. Um, so when it comes to um, you know, digital printing adoption, it's clear from these results that printers and converters are viewing the technology first and foremost as a way to improve their operational efficiency, tackling the short runs that continue to be on the rise and can tie up conventional presses better suited for long runs. 
Um, but just kind of wanted to um, sort of transition that conversation into hybrid and kind of how that fits into the equation. Um, you know, hybrid platforms can certainly provide the needed short-run assistance, but also due to their conventional components can bring the advantages of digital, such as um, variability, into some you know, medium-length runs as well. Um, from a speed-to-market perspective, hybrid also stands out because of its inline finishing capabilities mentioned earlier. Um, and with brands increasingly in need of quick turnaround times, having the ability to finish labels in line and not have to contend with the bottlenecks of offline conventional finishing for digitally printed output is another way a hybrid platform can put you ahead. And the last data point here um, that I wanted to stress was that almost half of our respondents stated that customer demand for digital was a driver behind their technology investment. Uh, when digital kind of first appeared on the scene, one of the biggest issues facing printers and converters was educating brands about what it could do and marketing those new capabilities to existing or prospective customers. Um, but based on this data, however, it appears that brands are catching on in understanding the advantages that digital provides and are specifically asking for it. Um, with hybrid, not only can you provide the new exciting opportunities that digital brings to the table, but you can stand out even more with embellishment capabilities that can really make a label or package shine. Um, so now that we've talked a bit about um, hybrid technology and the advantages that it provides, I wanted to just return back to some of the trends that we're seeing in the brand landscape and how digital or hybrid platforms can help printers adapt to these trends. Um, so first, this you know, may not be a surprise, but uh, craft, boutique, and artisanal brands are really continuing to, uh, to flourish. And it's not really just the, just the craft beer segment, despite all the, uh, the buzz that it gets for paving the way. Um, consumers are actively seeking out these brands in wine and spirits, confectionery, home products, health and beauty, nutraceutical, and, and really a lot more. Um, as these brands continue to proliferate, their unique needs will increasingly drive the need for digital. Um, since they produce small batches of product, they'll need short runs. Um, since they have the freedom to produce more limited edition products, a printing process that doesn't require plates can become particularly appealing. And really, due to their, um, their size and scope, they're you know, less inclined uh, to want to take on packaging inventory, making a more on-demand approach enticing. Um, and so lastly, as uh, mentioned previously, the, um, uh, the quality that digital provides can now really rival conventional and compete with the big brands. Um, so I just wanted to highlight just a, a couple examples of digitally printed products that have received high marks in our annual Package Printing Excellence Awards that we, um, that we run each, each summer. Um, so these samples that I wanted to highlight, um, they, they were produced using standalone digital rather than hybrid, but I, I just um, did want to highlight them as innovative ways to implement digital printing. Um, on the left, we have a digitally printed label for um, a gin that was produced by a craft distiller. That This actually received third place overall in our best of show voting in a competition that included um, entries from every printing process. And on the right, I just wanted to highlight a, a good example of versioning um, achieved through a digital press for a boutique chocolate maker. Um, so as hybrid technology continues to emerge and consumers increasingly seek out brands not typically found in the mainstream, the ability to produce digital output at reasonable costs and high quality will become increasingly important. And the more you're able to offer in terms of new decorative capabilities, the more premium of a package you'll provide. Um, so just to wrap up, I just wanted to reiterate why projections for hybrid's future continue to be positive. Um, you know, converters are continuing to view digital and conventional um, as complementary. That's backed up with some of the, uh, the research data that, that we found earlier this year. Um, but also brands are, are looking to digital and are beginning to understand what digital can provide for them. And with hybrid, the ability to combine both processes with inline finishing you know, make it a great, a great fit for brands consistently requesting digital and even being able to provide um, even more capabilities for them. Um, the rise of boutique craft and uh, artisan brands will maintain the demand for short-run, high-quality labels that match the premium nature of the product. And again, with hybrid, that ability to add some additional um, embellishments and other features to a package or a label makes it even more of a, a premium product. Um, we'll expect hybrid to become even more of a mainstream process. Um, you know, as the rate of technology continues, um, I think we'll see more and more of these um, you know, full-scale, entry-level, and retrofit systems begin to, uh, to hit the market. Um, and uh, we've seen some data around some early adoption trends. And um, yeah, and even, even in the past few years where hybrids first started to hit the scene, um, there's been a, a significant amount of adoption already. And I think as you know, more and more 
printers and converters demonstrate what can be done with the technology, um, we'll see you know, even more of these systems hitting, hitting the scene. And then lastly, I think we'll begin to see it expand beyond labels. Um, you know, as the technology develops, um, it's kind of going to be in the label segment as a bit of a launching pad, but then you know, expanding into folding cartons where we've seen a bit of an introduction um, there with some products that have, that have hit the market, but also getting into some, uh, some flexible packaging as well. Um, so that was, yeah, just kind of a bit of an intro on, on hybrid before we um, get into the, uh, the panel portion of, um, of our conversation today. So um, I'd now like to kind of transition over to, um, to that segment of the webinar and welcome in um, Debbie Gilbert, president of PRX Print, and Brad Knoth, CEO of Advantage Label. Uh, both Debbie and Brad have implemented hybrid printing technology into their businesses and provide a unique perspective on the advantages of hybrid and the benefits it brings to various brands. Um, but before we get into specifics on the hybrid assets at PRX Print and at Advantage Label, I um, just wanted to start with a little bit of background on each company. So, Debbie, I'd like to, um, to bring you on first. And, um, yeah, I was just wondering if um, you could just tell us a little bit about, um, about PRX Print and, um, yeah, just kind of an introduction to, to what the company is all about. Certainly, Corey. Uh, it's my pleasure to participate today. PRX was started about nine years ago, and we started as a print broker, and uh, it was one of the deepest recessions that we'd been to in most recent history, so it was a tough time, but we started out with an opportunity actually brokering IML labels, um, in mold labels then, and we then began to focus um, after that on the pressure-sensitive label market. Uh, as we evolved our business, um, we offered uh, free artwork and marketing consultation services that were value added for our clients. So we became self-taught on Adobe Illustrator and software like that, and we decided to differentiate ourselves primarily in a very crowded market um, by saving our clients money and time and doing artwork changes for them at no charge. So um, that's how our business really started out and started to grow. And over the next few years, um, in addition to pressure-sensitive labels, our product and service mix um, included thermal transfer imprinting services, shrink sleeve labels, uh, of course, the IML labels. We continued with those. And then we expanded to offer other kinds of print products, which included retail boxes, paperboard sleeves, marketing materials, forms, envelopes, and even some wide format products such as banners and signage. And of course, we were brokering uh, everything at that point um, until last year. So our main focus as a company has consistently been pressure sensitive labels, and most of our growth has been in that area over the past few years. But we are a uh, service provider of all types of packaging. Excellent. Thank you so much, Debbie, for, for sharing that and for, um, yeah, for joining us today to provide some, some more insight into, uh, into PRX and your experience with, with hybrid printing. Um, and so now, Brad, I'd like to, uh, to bring you on. Can you just um, tell us a little bit more about um, Advantage Label and, um, yeah, a little bit of an intro into, um, into your company? Sure. Thanks for having me, Corey. Uh, we started Advantage Label from scratch uh, back in 96, about 22 years ago. We started with a Mark Andy 830 Central Impression, 7-inch, very simple press. We were very focused on automotive. Um, we we're uh, a big reseller of thermal transfer printers, blank labels, ribbons. We became experts in the software, and that kind of got our company off um, to a start. And automotive became less and less fun, and we started to look at other things we could do, um, went into some other markets, bought a used 10-inch Comco Cadet. Um, then we uh, graduated to a new 2200 from Mark Andy. Um, then we went to a servo Mark Andy, so we kept adding 2200s. And we really stayed with that technology up until 2017 um, when we decided to move into um, P5, P7, uh, Digital Series, and also Digital 1. So we kind of um, swallowed the elephant there a bit. <laughs> Excellent. Perfect. Great. Thank you so much, Brad. And, and thank you for, for joining us today to um, share your experience at, at Advantage as well. Really appreciate it. Um, 
Excellent. So now to um, kind of get into some uh, some of the specifics around the um, digital and, and hybrid um, processes and experiences that um, that you're each having. Um, I'd like to actually just um, turn it back over to to Debbie. So Debbie, starting starting with you, kind of what what led PRX to want to bring label printing capabilities in house, and you know, how did how did the digital one fit um, fit your specific needs? Mm -hmm. Well, this is where business started to get really fun, as Brad alluded to for us anyway. Um, around five, six years ago, we started to notice some trends in our business uh, emerge, and those were a trend toward this new digital printing thing that uh, enabled people to have short runs and multi-SKUs without buying a whole boatload of plates. And um, they wanted to maintain high quality, but they wanted to come to us and get only a 1,000 labels or a small quantity of labels. And um, we were also noticing that there was a real push for fast lead times. Um, it seemed that after we started to emerge from the recession, um, companies and retailers in particular were less apt to um, have as much loyalty to, re to our customers in terms of keeping their products on the shelf. They were also wanting just-in-time turnaround of inventory. So that, of course, went down the supply chain and came to us as label manufacturers and suppliers. So we, we noticed these trends. And there was a prolifer proliferation of um, food market companies that were very small and ethnic-based, especially in the Toronto area. Um, we've had a lot of specialty markets emerge. And this, again, drove small quantities and multiple SKUs. So we were noticing all of these things, and, and our company product mix started to shift in favor of digital, which, of course, we were still brokering at the time. And... Um, we decided around 2016 that perhaps this was a time for us to leverage that demand and um, take a look at qu equipment to bring that uh, manufacturing capability in-house. So instead of brokering everything, why not bring it in-house and have even more control over not just our margins, but over our lead times and our quality. And so it was around that time, I guess it was late 2016, early 2017, that we really focused our, our search on digital label presses. And the Mark Candy Digital One came onto our radar um, shortly after it was launched in 2017. And we just felt that the D1 was a very attractive solution for us because while we had a good understanding of manufacturing from our backgrounds, we'd still not done any manufacturing ourselves as PRX. And so we didn't have finishing equipment. We didn't have a lot of the things that people in the print industry take for granted and have had. And so we were really, really new to this. And we needed something that would encompass as much as possible in one piece of equipment. So we started to be able to uh, evaluate all sorts of presses and eliminate the ones that would have a little bit of a financial barrier to entry for us in terms of okay, you've got a huge investment for the press, and now we've got almost the same amount of money on finishing equipment. We can't do that. So we saw this Mark Andy Digital One, and it was wonderful because it enabled us to overcome the financial barrier while achieving all of our other goals, which were providing very high-quality labels. Our, our, our company has always been focused first and foremost on quality of product and quality of customer service. So we did not want to um, have one something and then sacrifice another. So the digital one enabled us to overcome not only the financial barrier, but also maintain high quality, as I said, and be able to meet all of those emerging trends that we saw in our business of all of the small small runs, fast turnaround time, high quality, um, and have the finishing equipment all in one. So we didn't have two types of investments to make. Excellent. Perfect. And um, so, yeah, Debbie, just wanted to provide kind of a um, you know, quick follow-up there. I was wondering if we could um, kind of go a little bit deeper into the importance of having a solution with, um, with the inline finishing capabilities. You know, you mentioned that was um, kind of an important part of the process. So you know, I was wondering if we could explore that a little bit more about the importance of, you know, having, um, having that uh, solution in-house, yeah, with, with finishing right in line. Can you mm -hmm. tell us about, you know, why that was so important to PRX? Mm-hmm. Sure. Well, we... Um 
We, as I said, we wanted to make sure first and foremost that our financial um, goals were met. So we had to have a machine that wouldn't cost us as much for the machine as it would for the finishing equipment. So I guess that's the most blatant way to, to put that. But um, secondarily, we ended up hiring a what I would call a hybrid employee to, to run this press. He's got the beautiful uh, hands-on capability and experience of, of running. He worked in a wide format press environment before, so he was very very mechanically inclined, but he was able to then obviously handle all of the inline finishing that this press pushed out, but he also is a graphic designer. So we have that, and he was easily able to handle the inline finishing capability of this press. And the beauty of this is that it contributes to the fast lead time. You've got the material coming in one end and literally a label coming out the other. So I can't say more than that about this press. It's been just wonderful in terms of having everything under one piece of equipment, and um, it's just wonderful. It's quick. We have a lot of customers, again, in these niche markets that are hand-applying their labels, and these aren't going on a machine and being applied. So they don't want to have crack-and-peel labels on a sheet. They actually love the finished rolls that the digital one produces because they're taking 200 labels or 1,000 labels and putting them on by hand, and they're taking them now off of a roll instead of crack-and-peel off of a sheet, and that really makes their job easier, and that's actually been a selling point to many of our smaller clients as well. Excellent. Perfect. Thank you so much, Debbie, for, um, for that walkthrough of, of your decision to, uh, to move into hybrid. Really appreciate mm-hmm. that. Um, so then, Brad, switching back over to you and um, Advantage Label, you know, I understand that prior to Advantage Label bringing hybrid presses on board, um, you did have some uh, you know, either introductory or, like, or small format digital label equipment. So... Um, I wanted to, to just ask you, you know, what led to your decision to, um, to upgrade your digital capabilities and you know, why, why did Advantage opt to bring you know, both technologies, the digital series and digital one, on board uh, right around the same time? Sure. Well, much of what Debbie shared resonates with me and is true for Advantage Label. That's been true. Um, I guess if I boiled it down and just put it in two words, I'd say compelling math is why we you know, did what we did. And, you know, it's really hard to paint it with a broad brush. Um, Every company's business is a little bit different. And, you know, we were very on guard to um, not choose something that looked familiar to us, that saying that if you're good with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. We We were almost like, wanting to look at other technologies and choose something that was new and and different for us. Um, And we did look at those options, you know, printing and then, you know, the the conventional wisdom if you're selling that type of printer is, hey, you want to keep your printer running and you just want to keep it making labels and printing dollars and then you finish it over here. uh, on the opposite side, if you are used to conventional presses, it just looks and feels like the right way to do it. Um, but you could have a lot of downtime if you don't have the right mix of business and the right print technology. Um, so we we came up with a, a pretty good um, spreadsheet to compare the options. We did um, get a lot of assistance from Mark Andy with their projection tool. Um, a lot of the manufacturers will have a pro- projection tool to, to run the m- numbers and do the math. And um, we did, we had some surprises after we put through our, our test jobs. We have had a, a dozen or so um, test items that we actually went around to each manufacturer, you know, flew into each one of the facilities and did a day in the life um, on press running these jobs. And we took note of the time and effort and the changeover and um, the digital series for sure was the clear winner for our mix of business and those jobs we went down to to run. Um, And we also saw that there was an additional fit for the digital one for those jobs which you know, for us, we kind of think of 1,600 feet or less, and we actually had a pretty significant uh, amount of business that we did that was uh, 
in that run length. And we didn't want to bring in, make this major investment with the, the digital series and have that get tied up with some of those smaller jobs. And the, like I said, the beautiful thing was just do the math. And if, you, if you've got the right parameters in there and you're looking at the right things with your book of business, um, you, you have to trust that. And it just made a lot of sense for us to do it. Excellent. Perfect. And um, so, yeah, just kind of as a, as a follow-up to that, um, you know, now that, now that you have both presses kind of, um, you know, up and running, both the, the digital series and digital one, you know, we consider them to, to be a hybrid press, um, but they are, you know, pretty different in terms of uh, technology and capabilities. So, you know, now that, now that they've kind of both been up and running, you know, can you go into a little bit more um, around the strategy of how Advantage Label kind of uses them, uses them differently, both the digital series and digital one. Yeah, what are some of the uh, kind of driving decisions to go to one press um, versus another and, and kind of optimize them for what they do best? Sure, and and we try to make that pretty, um, it, it's transparent to the customer. We'll talk as much about technology as they're interested in, in talking about. We love to have customers come in and, and take a tour. However, we're, really trying to understand what they're expecting, what their needs are, and then and then fill that and make sure we have the right tools in place with our our software. We happen to use uh, an industry specific ERP package CIRM, which does a really great job of letting us look at a particular item or a family of items across a wide range of quantities um, with a you know from one SKU to 100 SKUs. You just put those parameters in, and it will tell us um, where the right fit is. And, you know, you, you have some, some things you see and learn after running a bunch of those jobs through there. And the, dig, the digital one, uh, again, that 1,600 foot, uh, it definitely does, it, it can, it does run a number of jobs that are, two, three, four times that length. Um, but typically, most of the jobs are 1,600 feet or less. Um, that press is very good. It's been, uh, the, the print engine is very robust. It's a very short web path. You, you put the material in, you drop the file down, you print your labels. It, it just, there's not a lot of messing around. And then on top of that, you got the, the finishing capability um, where you can either leave it uncoated, which the, the ink is very durable. It's, you know, if you compare that to some of the other um, similar technologies, um, you'll find the ink is very durable, or excuse me, the, the dry toner is very durable on the stock as is. Um, if you need to varnish it, if, you know, if you need to put a laminate on it, whether that's for additional durability or for look and feel, you can do that. Um, it's just been really great, really simple, really easy to get materials through the press. And I would like to say, um, you, you know, we're running our stock materials. We're, we're pulling semi-gloss off the the floor that we run um, for Flexo as well. So. That's true with both the digital series and the digital one. We're running our common materials for the most part. Once in a while, we'll have to prime something for um, digital series with the UV inkjet, but typically not. That's a huge benefit to be able to pull materials off the floor. Digital series, um, that has very robust ink durability, you know, the, the ink piling, you have control of how much ink you're layer, layering up, so you've got more control of the look and feel. You actually have a wider color gamut with CMYK with the UV inkjet because of that pile height of the ink. Um, so that's been excellent. And uh, the, the last thing I would say about the performance series right here would be, you know, we, we had that press built out in a way that um, we we use that on second shift a lot without even running the digital portion. I'm not, you know, that that's worked very well for us actually because we have more support on first shift for the digital front end and the things you need to do with our files. But 
that thing is basically like our P5, which is fully flexo um, on second shift when when needed. So does that does that help? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Brett. Really appreciate that. Yeah, that definitely helps. Um, you know, kind of get a good understanding of some of the the decision making around press utilization. Yeah, really appreciate that. Um, so, Debbie, kind of switching back over to you um, uh, at PRX and kind of um, you know some of your press utilization um, strategies as well. I was wondering if you could um, you know kind of walk us through a little bit on how um, you know PRX decides what jobs um, to print on on the digital one in house and and which ones may you know may get outsourced to a partner or or things like that. Yeah, just kind of wanted to. Um, walk through some of your decisions around press utilization as well? Mm -hmm, sure. Um, yeah, we, we've still obviously got a huge amount of business going out to partners that are trade only, and um, that's a very successful side of our business, so we, we don't want to neglect it. But um, for bringing jobs in-house on the D1, um, Particularly, it's been it's been useful for people that need fast turnaround time. We've had people come to us and say, you know, I need proto 50 prototype labels. Can you help me? It's for a launch at Costco, or I need um, a trade show uh, presentation, 100 labels to give away, or something. So we've had situations like that where um, it's been very very small quantities and things where they need them, you know, next day or same day or a couple of days, and that's that's perfect for our press. Um, as far as jobs and scoping them out to where they're going to go. Um, again, what Brad said stands true. In our costing system, we found that jobs that are certainly under the 2,000 linear feet uh, seem to price out better on our press in-house. Um, and, uh, so, and we're certainly noticing improvement on margins uh, when we keep things in-house. So that, that's got a consideration for us as a broker. But um, we, we find that the jobs that have small amounts of, of linear footage, fast turnaround time, um, where they're not really picky about matching a Pantone color. You know, when they really have to have a Pantone color matched, um, we can do one, which is great, on our press, but then you've got the drawback that you can't use that station for a varnish. So we have to balance that. But if they need a Pantone match uh, of one or more, we'll often just send that out for a flexo job which is fine. Um, we had a really unique situation on our hands literally the first week we deployed our press in February of this year, or, yeah, 2018. We had one of our longtime customers in the food industry call us and say, he, he just dropped it in my lap. He said, I've got a truckload of blueberries here, and they're not labeled. And I need labels, or the whole truckload is going to spoil, and I can't sell them. Can you help me? So in the past... I really probably couldn't have helped him because we're looking at a few days turnaround time even if my my digital print partner who's wonderful helped me out. It would still be a few days. Um, we literally used our graphic designer slash press operator. He whipped together a label in Illustrator for this gentleman, sent it to him, got it approved. We had only a couple of dies at the time and he was happy with one of them which was great. And we printed him all of the labels he needed and had them to him next day, next morning. So we saved the day with the blueberries, which was wonderful. And I love to recount that because it's a true real-life story. Um, so there's a situation there where it's been a, a real asset for us. Um, last week, many people may recall, there was a romaine recall throughout North America. Well, we, again, had two clients call us and badly need romaine, no, does not contain romaine labels. Um, again, to have the D1 for a simple label like that that you can just churn out quickly, same day, perfect. I mean, this is the type of thing that we're finding is bringing us not only increased revenue, but increased bottom line. So it's, it's been wonderful for that. Excellent. Thank you, Debbie. That's, that's a great story. Yeah, I love, love that story, and that's an excellent testament to, uh, to the capabilities of, of digital and, and hybrid. So, yeah, thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, so, Brad, switching, uh, switching back over to you now, um, you know, wanted to ask the, um, kind of about um, bringing, bringing Flexo into the mix and, and some of the, um, you know, color consistency. So now, now that you have um, Flexo, EP, and Inkjet all, of, uh, all under one roof, just wanted to kind of ask about some of the ways that you decide kind of how jobs get printed, but also, you know, how have you been able to, to ma maintain color consistency across the multiple devices and, you um, and the multiple printing technologies that you now have um, kind of at your, at your fingertips. I was wondering, yeah, could we, uh, could we dive into, uh, into that a little bit? 
Sure. Uh, again, it, it starts with understanding the expectation with the customer and, it, and, and having an educated sales force. If you do those two things, um, it's, it really prevents a lot of grief down the road. You know, if we're doing a good job discerning what the customer expects, we understand what they're asking, and we simply let them know what they can expect from us in the proposal, you're in pretty good shape. And, of course, to do that, um, you do need to do a little bit of homework and understand your equipment. So it's, it's as simple as um, a, across your technologies, identifying, you know, what is the color gamut? What is the, the range um, that, that the, the print envelope that that piece of equipment is in? And generally, you know, on the digital one, we kind of think of that as hitting um, about 50% of the Pantone um, book with CMYK. Now, you know, it, it really, again, depends on your customer, are you, is, is it blue, is it green, is it, you know, some certain colors are tougher to hit than others. Um, now, interestingly, on the digital series with the UV inkjet, because you have control of the pile height and some inherent properties of the ink, that's closer to 80% um, of the Pantones you can hit. Uh, one of the surprises we had when we went around and tested at different manufacturers, you know, some of the manufacturers had extended gamut printing. So it wasn't just CMYK. They were adding orange or violet or purple mm -hmm. or, or green to, you know, have a, a wider palette of dots to make up. And, and they would say they would get further into the, the Pantone book. That was you know, on the spreadsheet, it looked very compelling, but going out with our files, we actually saw uh, superior color matches that would get to a, a better delta result um, on the spectrophotometer with the, with the Mark Andy CMYK compared to extended gamut from some of the others. Um, so you really need to understand the color gamut, your customer, and then also what, what are you putting on top of Are you putting anything on top of the print? Are you putting a matte finish or a semi-gloss or a gloss or a laminate? All those things um, affect the look and feel appearance of the label. Um, and there's, that's probably where a lot of the opportunity lies to beat the competition is understand what you have and then be able to put on your thinking cap and put something together um, that's going to work for them, especially when they have very short runs and very long runs that all need to sit on the shelf and look the same. Absolutely. Perfect. Thank you, Brad. Um, and um, so, yeah, it looks like we are um, – we have time to move into um, a couple of our, our last topics here, and then we'll go into our, um, our Q&A. Just wanted to provide a uh, reminder to everyone in the audience that we are going to leave about, um, about 10 minutes or so for Q&A at the end. So if, um, if you do have a question for, um, for either of our panelists, um, definitely um, please uh, send, uh, send in a question, and um, you know, we, uh, we should be able to, uh, to get to most of them. It looks like there have been a few that have come in, but if, um, if there is a question that you still wanted to uh, to cover, please feel free to uh, to send it our way. Um, but to just kind of uh, move into a little bit of a new topic, wanted to um, kind of ask a little bit um, from both panelists about um, the um, reaction um, that um, that you've seen from brand owners in terms of how they are kind of reacting to see to what hybrid um, can provide to them, and um, but also some of the um, some of the trends that you're seeing among brand owners and and your customers in recent years, and kind of how hybrid has helped you um, meet those needs and, and meet those challenges. So, um, I guess Debbie, we can switch back over to you, um, and uh, yeah, can you just tell us a little bit about some of the uh, the brand trends that you're seeing, and and yeah, how hybrid has helped you uh, helped you meet these needs. 
Mm-hmm, sure. Um, well, as we've I've sort of touched on, Corey, um, that you touched on at the beginning, um, there's been a, a real trend in, um, I guess you call it specialty markets or ethnic markets here in the GTA we call the Greater Toronto Area, um, and that has driven um, a brand uh, proliferation and also multi skews. Um, we have several customers that have uh, multi skews of the same label, same basically the same label, just with small customizations on it. Um, it may be that it's targeted to different retailers and it just has minor changes on it, or it may be just a flavor change uh, differentiator, like you had on one of your early slides. Um, so that's a really big big deal in the market today, in the digital market, and customers don't want to, and nor do they have the money always to spend on printing plates. It's quite an investment, and if you have um, 10 or 12 versions of something, you could be looking at upwards of 40 plates, and that's a very expensive investment for customers to make, especially small companies and at small quantities, um, and the per unit price is very, very high. What we found is um, when we come to them with a quote for digital um, they're very open to receiving it and very happy to see that they don't have plates to invest in. For some people, that's a very new concept still that, oh, I don't have plates? No, you don't have any plates. And even when the per unit price might be slightly higher than it would be for Flexo um, longer run quantities, they're still more than happy with the quotes because they don't have that huge investment to uh, that financial barrier, so to speak. So that's that's probably the biggest thing for brands, if you want to speak about brands. Um, but again, as, as we've talked about too, you have the whole inventory situation, and that is that people don't have the space or the money to sit on inventory. So they're ordering small quantities, and that, that's a big reason for it as well. Um, nobody wants to commit to things because retailers change their mind about both their product and holding it, and they change their mind about what's on it. And we've also had um, a lot of changes in our labeling in terms of government regulations up here in Canada, and that may be the same in the U.S., but when uh, Health Canada changes allergen labeling, for instance, or nutritional fact labeling, um, that also impacts our customers and that forces them to invest in new plates if they've had to already. Whereas when we do digital and with PRX, we don't have any um, artwork charges for them because we absorb them and do them ourselves in-house and now there's no plate charges for them either because there are no plates. It's all digital, and they can make changes. They don't have fear of investment or loss of money, and there's certainly no impact on time and, and lead time. So those would be probably the main things I would speak to with regard to brands. Excellent. Perfect. Thank you, Debbie. Really appreciate that insight. Um, Brad, how about, how about you? Anything on the, uh, the brand owner side? Any new trends that, um, that you've seen on, on your end and kind of how, um, how hybrid technology has been able to kind of rise to the occasion to, uh, to meet those needs? Well, Debbie covered a lot of it there very well. Um, as much as I'd like to say that customers just go wild over the opacity of the white or the way the colors pop, stuff that we get really fired up about when we're obsessing over the labels, um, <laughs> that's they just kind of expect that. They expect it to be beautiful and consistent. And what they seem to get more fired up about is us making their job easier by um, allowing them to stock lower quantities, get them um, their product more quickly, um, give them a lower total cost, not necessarily by, um, you know, just lowering the price, but some of those plate costs and dynamics, um, they're paying the same amount per label, but they're just able to change that more often um, without buying plates. Um, that's appealing. So it's, it's probably they get more excited at least our customers, more excited about the logistics mm -hmm. um, than they do the actual print quality and appearance of label. They kind of expect that to be awesome. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Perfect. Um, great. So just kind of keeping, uh, keeping an eye on the time, I wanted to move into just one other sort of last topic that we could do, a bit of a, a quick hit on before we get into some of the Q&A. Um, but, you know, I thought this was an important one that, um, you know, really wanted to, uh, to make sure that we covered. Um, you know, since, since digital and, and hybrid in particular is, um, 
you know, pretty pretty new on the scene, and um, you know, I think us in the industry, you know, definitely have a good familiarity as to what it can do. But you know, on the brand side, maybe um, they may not be quite so familiar with the technology and, and the advantages that it can provide. Um, just wanted to see if um, if we could do a quick hit, um, just kind of on some of the strategies that you've taken to um, kind of help help get the word out and help get customers kind of understand the uh, the capabilities of of what hybrid can do. Um, so yeah, if we could just do um, you know maybe a, a minute or so just to kind of uh, talk a little bit on on that topic, Debbie, I'd, I'd love to just kind of turn it over to you. And what are what are some of the uh, kind of the ways that you're kind of getting the word out there for for PRX? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, well, I would say we've probably always taken on a blend of traditional pull and push strategies in our company. Um, with regard to the pull side, we we do a lot of promotion through social media pro platforms like LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. We use that to draw customers in. Um, we tell them about our, you know, exactly the features we've been talking about for the last little while here, you know, multi-version capability, low-cost impact, no investment in plates, fast turnaround time, those types of things. Um, we've also had wide success since we implemented the digital one with referrals and networking. That's been very effective for us in growing our business. Um, on the push side, we do have direct sales, and um, our, what we do is we typically send our person or people out to do uh, field research. They go out, they look at what's out there, they see the trends, they see the products on the shelf, then they sometimes take those and, and either improve upon it in our way and talk to the customer about their label, or they do cold calling and see what's out there. Um, we've, we've also had some involvement in trade shows and some uh, industry associations. And, um, and then we mine our current relationships with our existing clients, and we expand our sales that way. We, we take on, um, you know, flexo customers that we have had for years or people that are buying other types of products from us, and we just basically offer them our digital capabilities that are enhanced now with shorter lead times, graphic design services, and, uh, and we just basically tell them we're well positioned to be a one-stop shop for you now. Excellent. Great. Thank you, Debbie. Yeah, definitely some, some great strategies there to, uh, to get the word out. Um, so, Brad, just, um, yeah, no, again, just kind of real quick, uh, same question, but, yeah, I'd love to kind of um, uh, hear from Advantage as well about some of the ways that, you know, you're getting the word out there, especially kind of having both technologies in-house. Um, you know, how are you going about kind of um, explaining uh, what, what it can do and, and some of the, uh, the capabilities and advantages? Sure, yeah. Yeah, just real quickly, I would say, um, you know, we're, we're, a, we're a sales organization. We're very um, direct sales oriented, and we're not out there selling digital per se and not even really like selling labels as much as we are trying to form a relationship with the customer to, uh, number one, help them sell their product. Uh, that, that's, I guess that's the key is helping them sell their product and making it very easy for them to work with us. I know that's kind of an overarching thing that we would all say, most of us would say that's um, what we're trying to do, but we really key on that. If they want to come in and peek behind the curtain and check out and talk about all that stuff, we, we love to do it, but we really try to just um, help them sell their product and, and make it as easy for them as possible, and, and that's what's been working for us. Excellent. Sounds good. Sounds good. Thank you, Brad. Um, so yeah, thank you again, both both Debbie and Brad, for for taking part in the in the panel session. Really appreciate your insight and and sharing with us. So just um, you know, we do have um, about five to ten minutes uh, for for a little bit of Q and A, and we we did have some some good questions come in. So um, yeah, just thought we would transition a bit um, into uh, into the Q and A session here. Um, so yeah, I guess just um, this first question kind of goes back to the the color matching topic, and um, you know the question that was presented is you know how can we how can we speed up color matching against um, against a previous flexo job, and um, you know if there are any recommendations around um, around software for color matching that's out there, um, you know, we could touch on that as well. But um, yeah, just uh, looks like we're um, kind of asking a little bit about uh, kind of the color matching process and. Um, yeah, what's some of the um, the ways that you can you can do that kind of efficiently and and with as much um, speed as possible? So, Brad, you, you touched on that before, so I was wondering, yeah, if we could dive into that maybe a little bit more. Yeah, lots of different ways to approach that for sure. Um, you definitely want some sort of software-based solution that helps you um, measure those colors, and you know that usually involves something like 
from a company like X-Rite or something where you're using one of their spectrophotometers and you're kind of measuring a reference color and um, just trying to um, move whatever you're, you're printing with close to that. Um, one thing I want to say with the with the digital, it's pretty cool because you, you set up profiles for different materials. You kind of go through that process, and um, once you get some success, you kind of record that information for particular materials, and so you're not chasing color every time you go to run that job. Um, I guess that's the, the short answer. Um, only other thing, on the Flexo side, um, you know, there's some pretty good tools to to figure out where you're going to be on that before it gets to press so you're not chasing it on press. So quick answer on that, I guess. Excellent. Perfect. Thanks, Brad. And um, Debbie, um, you know, for, for you, um, you know, maybe not um, matching up against, you know, Flexo being done being done in-house given PRX, but, um, yeah, just, um, you know, your, your strategies on, on mm -hmm. color management, you know, anything that we could go into there that you're using on the digital one to, um, mm -hmm. you know, kind of make sure that you're hitting colors, yeah. Yeah, well, we have had to do that because um, oh, okay. when you yeah. think about it, we, we have many jobs that are flexible that we've been sending out of house for years, and then the odd time the person will come to us and say, oh, my gosh, I need 100 of them, like ASAP, right, and we're like, right, oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it has come up. And um, one of the tools we found very useful was one that was given to us when we first went down to Mark Andy to look at the press, the digital one, and that was um, the Pantone Bridge Book. And I can't under underestimate or I can't talk about um, that in, in, you know, without talking about that bridge book and the value that it's had to us as a company. Um, I would say Brad's right. You can't, without CMYK OV capability on press, there are far fewer Pantones you can actually match. But um, that said, we haven't really run into it as a huge problem. Our press operator is very skilled. He's a graphic designer, so he's got the adjustment capability at the front end, and he's got the adjustment capability on the press. So you've got both interfaces you can work with to adjust color. You use the bridge book um, as close as you can, and we've made the adjustments. And most of the time, we've come very, very close, and um, it hasn't been a problem. There are shades that are more difficult to match than others, though, for sure. Right, absolutely. Perfect. Um, and yeah, it looks like we could maybe do one or two more. So just wanted to um, kind of move into one that uh, kind of touches on, on setup time um, and kind of, you know, a little bit of uh, some of the strategy there and um, yeah, kind of some more info around, around setup time. I know with, uh, you know, with digital, one of the great advantages is um, kind of how, um, you know, how, how quickly setup time can be and, and how you can kind of move from, from job to job. So just kind of wanted to get some, uh, some insight around, you know, how either kind of how long it may take or just, yeah, some general strategies around setup time, especially for hybrid with, um, um, you know, printing, cutting, and all of the, the inline processes. So, yeah, any, um, any insight there in terms of, you know, setting up one of these presses to run a job and any, you know, advantages or kind of general statistics around that? And I guess that could be for, well, uh, <clears throat> for either, yeah. Well, I'll just share an advantage label here. I would say, you know, we We've got some really, again, I, the, the technology is great. You need to, you need to have the right system and, and software to, to make sense of it. So you can, you know, you don't really want to do things based on seems like, feels like. You want to actually have that information and, and measure what you're trying to, to manage. And, and we've worked hard with that. And that's, you know, when we got these uh, digital assets in, we also, um, went live with uh, with the CIRM software, which helps us do that. Um, and so I, I'm i just pointing that out because that's allowed us to see that our um, available production time for the same exact work um, has is between 27% and 40% less setup time on your on your average work week so if we took our average work week um, before we had digital uh, it's it's that much more efficient we've we've carved you know a, a third or so of time we've recaptured that because we're just uh, where appropriate not spending all that setup time with uh, getting the color up and and getting the plates mounted and all that sort of thing. 
it was pretty huge. It's pretty, it's like, thankfully the business is growing. So it's not like, oh man, now we, <laughs> we have to get rid of people. It's no, we've got that capability now to, to gain new business without adding people, which is better for everyone. Right. Absolutely. Um, perfect. So I think we could maybe do uh, do one more real quick. Um, and Brad, this is actually one that we kind of talked about a little bit up front. Um, so I just wanted to kind of ask, you know, how does a firm's graphic file management change uh, when they get a hybrid press? And are there any cultural changes that need to happen with that? I um, was wondering, yeah, what your experience around that may have been. Well, in, in some ways, it's very similar. And, and the way it's similar is that, you know, you've got a reference file that the customer and the company have agreed upon is the target and the reference file. Um, you know, we all have that, whether we're doing Flexo or digital. So, you know, that doesn't change. What, what does change is um, the situation where you need the ability to, for smaller quantities, send that to digital and uh, for larger runs, perhaps send it to Flexo and, have plates made. Um, again, you want to have a good system in place so that there's not confusion when the order comes in and people aren't just deciding um, where something should go based on maybe two parameters when they really should be thinking about eight parameters, which is what the software does for you. Um, so you need to have a system in place that uh, can help you do that efficiently. Um, and that culturally, that can be a little difficult because, you know, people may be used to walking around with, you know, paper and folders and jackets. And, you know, sometimes it's hard to pry the fingers off that stuff. But if you can continue to work on your system and instill confidence in the system, then you can move toward that efficiency and, you um, it's it's a bit of it's a bit of heavy lifting to make that change if you're doing a ton of business that is run on multiple technologies. If it's more defined, where you know items are always on a particular technology, or you just have one technology, then I wouldn't think it's a whole lot different. Right. Absolutely. Great. Thank you so much, Brad, for for that insight and. Um, it looks like we are actually just about out of time for today. So, um, again, a big thank you to our panelists today, Debbie Gilbert and Brad Knoth. Um, and on thank behalf you. of Package Printing and Mark Andy, um, I wanted to thank you all for attending uh, today's webinar. Um, please be sure to check out our webinar page to get information on all of our archived and upcoming webinars. And if you would just take a minute to fill out the, um, the brief feedback survey that will appear on your screen next, we would be grateful. Uh, your feedback will influence the webinars that we bring you in the future, and I hope to see you at the next package printing webinar. Uh -huh.